get ready for our trek to Everest. Climbing Mount Everest requires training and eating the right food to prepare for your adventure. After all, you've got to fuel up for all that exercise. Your climb may involve some work and unexpected surprises, but you'll learn to rely on your climbing team each and every day, every step of the way. Gear up for the life-changing adventure of a lifetime. Morning. Each Sunday, Jason reminds us of our mission statement and our pillars of the church. The children being one of the core pillars of the church, I feel is extremely important to help them build a relationship with God. What better way to do that than through BBS? We are in need of adult volunteers and food items. We need nursery workers and helpers. Helpers will assist crew leaders into shuffling the children to their different stations. Food items are 300 cookies, 16 small bottles of ketchup, peanut butter and jelly, and juice packs. If you don't feel that you can do any of these things, then please be in prayer for VBS that we can reach as many children as possible to build those relationships. At this time, I would like to thank Grace Church for allowing the children to have this action-packed, God-filled, praise worship week. Thank you to all of those who have donated. A very special thanks to those of you who stepped up to volunteer. Without you, BBS would not be possible. I would like to encourage all of you to come to our closing on Thursday night at 8.30 because the children will have worked so hard for this special worship. If you have not picked up your materials from me, or you would like to volunteer, or you have any questions, you can see me on the children's wing right after the church service. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for your uh, service and dedication to ministry for our children here at Grace and in this community. Welcome. We are glad you're here this July the 5th, the day after July the 4th, where folks have come and gone, and some of them are still gone, as you look around and see, um, but we are glad that you are here and have chosen to be here in this worship service today. Hopefully you received an order of worship on your way in this morning. Um, inside your order of worship is a card. If you are a first-time guest with us, we invite you to fill this card out and share with us your information so that we can stay in contact with you. Um, if you are a regular attender or a church member and you've had a change in information, such as email address, mailing address, phone number, please share with us that change of information. On the back side of your card, you will see an opportunity for you to share um, prayer requests with us. You will also see an opportunity to share uh, what God's doing in your life. Maybe our prayer, our hope, our expectation is that the Holy Spirit will move in your life today that, and that you will take a next step in your faith journey. And if that happens for you today, we would invite you to write that on the back of the card and share that with us as well. Um, so what to do with this card? On your way out the door this morning, there will be a basket there. We just ask you to place this card in the basket, and uh, they will be picked up after the service. So again, take note of the card there. If you open up, you'll see uh, a listing of things inside the order of worship, a calendar of events for this week. Um, please take note, uh, this Tuesday at 5.30, we'll be having a special called finance meeting. Um, if you are a part of the finance committee, please make sure um, you are present and accounted for. Um, next Sunday, July the 12th, we have a couple special things going on that day. Um, 8.30 in the morning, our Methodist men's breakfast, which means if you're a man, you're invited to come and join in this breakfast, join together in fellowship, um, and just come together. You don't have to be a member of the church, you just have to be a man. We invite you to come and be a part of uh, this, the men's breakfast next Sunday morning. Also, you'll notice, too, next Sunday is our sock slash big stuff service. And what that is, is for those of you who are um, aware of Sockahatchee, or maybe you're unaware of it, Sockahatchee is a ministry of the United Methodist Church in, in the state of South Carolina in which churches um, send groups of folks ages 14 and up to go and work on homes for folks um, who are less fortunate than we are. And the whole goal of Sockahatchee is to make those homes warm, safe, and dry. Uh, Big Stuff is a camp that our youth go to also every summer. They've already been to both Big Stuff and Sockahatchee so far this summer. 
And so next Sunday, we're going to have the opportunity to hear from some of those who have participated in big stuff at Sockahatchee camps, how God moved in their life during these camps and how they want to share that with you, the church. And also, this is an opportunity for us to hear from our youth of how the way grace is investing in the lives of our youth, how it's changing them. So just want you to be aware of that special service coming up next Sunday and hope that you will be here. Um, a couple other things. Again, don't forget Vacation Bible School. The registration, if you have not already signed up your child and or children, please do so today. And again, if you're interested in serving and helping Miss Carol out this year, please make sure you talk with her today. Um, Wednesday, July 15th, we have a very special worship service going to be going on in here. Um, some of you may remember Mason Taylor. Some of you may not have an idea who Mason Taylor is. Mason is the uh, oldest child of uh, the predecessor here at Grace. Eddie Taylor was pastor here at Grace before me coming uh, to serve with you guys. And uh, his oldest son, Mason, is uh, moving on in his music career. And we have the opportunity, before he makes it too big, we have the opportunity to say, hey, we knew him before. And uh, so he's going to be here with his band. They're going to be leading us in worship on Wednesday, July the 15th. That begins at 7 p.m. So we invite you to please uh, make sure you're here and share in this special time of worship and our special time of supporting Mason. Um, final thing. Um, Tables of Grace, hopefully you received an email this week. Um, our Wednesday night meals during the summer are tough because so many people fluctuate in and out during the summer months. And our cook teams um, are preparing for a good bit of folks, and we're not having that many folks come and eat, so we have leftover food, plus we're not getting a, a, a return on the money that's invested in preparing these meals. So what we have decided to do through uh, Finance Church Council, uh, talking with Pam and then myself, us all collaborating together, we decided for the rest of the month of July, because we already have some special services going on and Vacation Bible School going on, that we will not have meals through the rest of July in the first two weeks of August. However, what that does mean is that we still want to provide meals for our shut-ins. Um, and we want to make sure that they're cared for just as we've been doing. So what we need from you guys are volunteers to help uh, prepare the meals uh, for one or two shut-ins. If you will, if you're interested in doing this and helping out our Tables of Grace team, Pam, if you'll raise your hand, you can talk with Pam or you can call the church office and talk with Kathy, and we can get you set up for that. But we want you to be aware of, of that ministry opportunity for our shut-ins and providing food for them. And I believe that's it. All right. I invite you to stand together this morning as we open in song.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity, dear Lord, to be able to meet in your house this morning to, to sing praises to your name. Lord, we remember those that have fought in wars before, and we remember those that are fighting now to bring us freedom that we can be openly in your house and worship and lift praises up to you. Lord, remember those that are sick and can't be here today, dear Lord, and uh, we just ask now that your Holy Spirit come upon this service and bless us so that we can receive a blessing from your word that Jason's going to bring to us. And we'll continue to pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespassers as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. While we're all standing, let us join together in affirming our faith this morning with the Apostles' Creed, these words that remind us of the basics, the essentials of the Christian faith. Let us join together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. While you're up, take a moment, greet those around you, welcome them to grace.
may be seated. At this time, let us continue worshiping God with God's tithe and our offering as we have this chance to give back to God a portion of what is God's and God's tithe, and then we have the chance to, to give beyond a tithe in an offering. And as we give, we give knowing that everything received in this place goes to further ministry. And what I mean by the further ministry is to further the name of Jesus Christ in this community, in this state, nation, and world. And so God calls us to give. So let us remember this truth that we are never more like God than when we are giving. As God is the ultimate giver for all people. Let us pray together. God, you give. You give with no strings attached. You give because you love. Gracious God, may we now, at this time, seize this opportunity to give back to you. God, to give back to you as we respond in the love that you've shown to us, we give. And Holy Spirit, we pray that in your working in your power, that everything received in this giving today be multiplied by you. Lord, may we give cheerfully. May we give as you give with no strings attached. For your work, for your mission, for the growing of your kingdom, that by faith, earth may look a little more like heaven because of how we give. And real quick, before we started singing, or we start singing, I wanted to welcome the choir back here this morning. I'm excited to have them here with us, leading us in a couple of songs. These songs should be fairly familiar to you, and we chose to do these songs today because we want to thank God for the freedom that he does give us each and every day. So please sing along with us as we sing. Yeah. 
And if we could please stand as we present God's tithes and our offerings. you can be seated and children can be dismissed for children's church at this time. Our scripture reading today comes from Ezekiel 2, 1 through 7 uh, from the New Revised Standard Version, the vision of the scroll. He said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet, and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, Mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impertinent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you will say to them, Thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house. They shall know that there has been a prophet among them. And you, O mortal, do not be afraid of them, and do not fear of their words, their their briars and thorns surround you and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of their words and do not be dismayed at their looks for they are a rebellious house. You shall speak my words to them whether they hear or refuse to hear for they are a rebellious house. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I was listening to uh, Miss Nancy read that word from the prophet Ezekiel. And we get to the part where it's part of our tradition where the reader says the word of God for the people of God. And we always respond, sometimes without even thinking, thanks be to God. But did you, did you hear what she said this morning? Those words pointing to where we're going to talk in just a moment of, of what Jesus experienced, even though it was the Lord speaking through the prophet Ezekiel. These words were lived out through Jesus Christ. But we'll get to that in just a moment. Let's think about something. I would imagine you're a lot like me in that you like to be comfortable. Is that a fair assessment? You like to be comfortable. Does anyone like to be uncomfortable? Please raise your hand. Carol, you like to be uncomfortable? Or you don't like to be? You were uncomfortable up here this morning, weren't you? <laughs> yes, absolutely. But we like to be comfortable. And when I say I like to be comfortable, what I mean is I like my comfort zone. Not only do I like to be comfortable in the sense of, at the end of the day, I want to put my athletic shorts on and a big T-shirt and sit in my house and just chill. That's comfortable to me. But I also like my comfort zone. And here's what some of my comfort zones look like. is, is, is Again, being at home. A comfort zone for me is being on the lake. Maybe a comfort zone, maybe you can relate with me on this one too, is sitting in a chair on the beach. Part of my comfort zone is having my routine in place. Does anybody function by a routine? When that routine gets a little out of whack, does it feel uncomfortable? I'm a creature of habit. I have my way of doing things. I have my viewpoints on things. And again, I would imagine you are a little bit like me. When something or someone challenges those areas in which I feel comfortable, it's then I find myself quickly becoming uncomfortable. So here's an exercise for us. That'll help you not go to sleep so early on in the sermon this morning. How comfortable would you be if I said, okay, everybody stand up. So everybody stand up. If you are able, stand up. 
Now, swap sides. If you sit over here, sit over here. If you sit over here, sit over here. See, y'all look at me like, dude, you have lost your mind. You have lost your mind. Some of you are like, I'm so comfortable where I am. I sit in the same seat every week. We have created chaos. See, look at that. All right. When you get to your new seat, See, some of y'all are uncomfortable because we sit in the same seat every week and the seat has been formed to our backside. And so it's a natural sit down and just flow right into it. And if you didn't change, that's okay. The whole point is we like to be comfortable. And something as simple as once you sit in a new seat today can rise up a feeling of uncomfortable in our life. And that's not the only thing. A friend of mine sent me a picture this week, and I'm going to pull that up in just a second. But um, sometimes words in Scripture make us uncomfortable. And, and there's a term when it comes to the things in Scripture that make us uncomfortable. That term is we will cherry pick Scripture, which means we will pick the things that we like and we will disregard the things that we don't like. So we have, we have an image. A friend sent me this, and I thought, it's way too good not to share this Sunday. And some of it is somewhat controversial. I will add to that. But it's the whole point of it. Here's the cherry-picked Bible. All verses, all verses Christians do not want to follow have been omitted. Get yours today so you can eat shellfish, get tattoos, control women. And as a bonus, we've added anti-gay verses Jesus never said. And some of you, you read that and you hear me say that and you begin to get uncomfortable because your automatic thought was, Jason must agree or somewhat would, no. I don't. The whole point is, Scripture can even make us uncomfortable to the point that that can be our real life. We cherry pick what we like and disregard what we do not like. We'll cherry pick on pointing towards telling others what to do. But when we read passages of Scripture, like forgive others the way I have forgiven you, we ain't crazy about that one. Or someone offends you, turn the other cheek. Love your neighbor. Or as Jesus said, love each other the way I have loved you. We can get real uncomfortable at times with Scripture. We can get uncomfortable at times if we're not careful with Jesus. You think, no, I would never get uncomfortable with Jesus. Jesus is so loving and caring, and He is. But if we are going to follow after Jesus, He will eventually make you uncomfortable. And if we are not careful, we'll be so wrapped up into our comfort that we will trip over Jesus. And never end up following him. Because following Jesus will make us uncomfortable. And your takeaway point for today is when we follow Jesus, here it is, life can become radically different. When we follow Jesus, life can be radically different. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. I'm going to read from the message this morning. And if you don't have your Bibles, you can follow along on the screen. We're going to read 13 verses, verses 1 through 13 in Mark, the Gospel, uh, chapter 6. We're going to read verses 1 through 6, talk about those for a moment, and then do the rest uh, of those verses 7 through 13. We talk about being uncomfortable, talking about 
Jesus at times when we decide to follow him can make us uncomfortable. We're going to read in just a moment. We're going to read about a scenario. When Jesus went home, he went to his hometown. He went to his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. And Jesus, his desire was to get his hometown folks moving, to get them to follow him, to get them to do something of significance for God's kingdom. But what he did when he began to get them moving, to do something for God's kingdom, he moved them out of their comfy, cozy way of doing things. And they hated it. They hated it to the fact that they turned on Jesus. And if you were here last week, we talked a little bit of last week from, from Jesus' teachings about what it is and the stories of Jesus' healings of what it is to move from, from, from walking the line of fear to faith. And when we move from fear to faith, we're going to find ourselves uncomfortable. When we decide to follow Jesus with every area of our life and to live that every area in our life in faith, we're going to find out that we're, we're going to end up costing us something. And life can be radically different. Because when we follow Jesus things get a little uncomfortable. If you will, follow with me. Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. We're going to read it, and then I'll just, we'll, we'll go back and kind of talk about it a little bit line by line. Beginning verse 1. He left there and returned to his hometown. His disciples came along. On the Sabbath, he gave a lecture in the meeting place, and he made a real hit, impressing everyone. We had no idea he was this good, they said. How did he get so wise all of a sudden, get such ability? But in the next breath, they were cutting him down. He's just a carpenter. That's Mary's boy. We've known him since he was a kid. We know his brothers, James, Justice, Jude, and Simon, and his sisters. Who does he think he is? They tripped over what little they knew about him and fell sprawling. And they never got any further. Here's the link to that passage from Ezekiel we heard a few moments ago. Jesus told them, A prophet has little honor in his hometown, among his relatives, on the streets he played in as a child. Jesus wasn't able to do much of anything there. He laid hands on a few sick people and healed them, that's all. He couldn't get over their stubbornness. He left and made a circuit of the other villages teaching. If you read through the New Testament, we'll, we, you, you can see, and we could talk about it all day today, but we're not going to talk about that. But if you read through the New Testament, you can see a consistent theme of Jesus being rejected by his own people. In fact, if you get right into the, the, the Gospel of John, within the first few verses, the Gospel of John tells us that Jesus was rejected by his own people. So that, that's, that's a consistent theme in the New Testament. But when we read these first few passages in Mark chapter 6, it's not just the Jews as a whole that are rejecting Jesus. This is Jesus' own people for real. This is his family. This is his friends. These are the kids he grew up with, playing whatever first century kids played back in the day. He grew up with them. He knew them. They knew him. And he comes into his hometown synagogue, and something crazy happens. At first, they are amazed by his teaching. And then all of a sudden, something shifts, and they begin to just push him out and say, dude, we, we're tripping over you. We can't take any more of what you're saying. We hear you, and we honestly don't like it, Jesus. But up to this point in the Gospel of Mark, what Jesus had been teaching the crowd, what Jesus had been teaching his disciples is what discipleship meant. To follow him. To follow him in faith, even when it doesn't make sense, because Jesus, again, if you remember back a few chapters prior to this one, Jesus talked about having just enough faith of that of a mustard seed, that if you just got a little bit of faith and you'll give me what little bit you have, I can make a lot out of a little if you will trust me and follow me, even when it doesn't make sense. So Jesus had been teaching the crowd, teaching his disciples about what it means to follow him. And let us always be reminded that when we choose to follow Jesus, life can be radically different. And so again, back to this story, Jesus comes home to his hometown. They ought to be celebrating. Here's what I thought about. You know those instances when there's this small town and the small town person goes and does something amazing and they come back home? Well, that's before they ever get home. The, the, the small town's going nuts. Like, yeah, that's our boy. We knew him when. Then the small town person comes home. And they, they celebrate. They maybe even exaggerate. They begin to tell stories. I remember them when they were just a little chap. 
You know who I think about? I think about most recently probably Casey Ashley from Donald's who won the Bassmaster Classic at the first of the year. Y'all familiar with that story? That young man? I mean, they had Casey Ashley Day in Donald's. See, I would imagine something like that happening for Jesus when he gets to Nazareth. But the text tells us when he begins teaching that they're somewhat amazed. Let's hear it again. He said, he left there, returned to his hometown. His disciples came along on the Sabbath. He gave a lecture in the meeting place. He made a real hit. He was impressing everybody. And do you hear what they said? We had no idea he was this good. We had no idea. I mean, he's always been a pretty sharp guy, always nice, respectful. We had no idea he was this good. Then they began to say, how did he get so wise all of a sudden? How did he get such ability? And, I, and I, would, I, I would challenge us to think about not only were they saying this about Jesus being wise all of a sudden and such great ability for this specific uh, situation in context of Mark chapter 6, but be mindful of the stories that had preceded him before he got back to his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. The, the, the stories that had preceded him about his amazing teaching that he had been doing before he got there. The stories that had preceded him about the healings that he had done, about casting out demons, about the uh, Jairus' daughter who was healed because she was really dead. Everybody knew that, but he raised her up. Or about the woman with, who had had the blood, the issue with blood for 12 years, and how she just reached out and touched the hem of his garment, and she was made whole. All these stories stories have preceded him. So when he gets to this place and he begins to teach, they're impressed. They're thinking, how in the world did he get so good? But then within just a split second, they then begin to ask the question, but where did this cat get all this wisdom and this such great ability? Because we really know who he is. Because in a moment, they flip on him just like a switch. Because verse 3 tells us, in their next breath, they were cutting him down. They couldn't understand it. They heard him, but they didn't really want to hear what he had to say. Because they begin to cut him down. They say, hey, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. We know you, man. You're Mary's boy. And I think Mark was intentional in not including who Jesus' earthly father was. Because in that culture and in that time, he would be even looked more down on. The significance when Mark says that this crowd in the synagogue, after they come out of their holy huddle, they said, We know you. You're Mary's son. We don't know much about your dad. But we do know when, 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 when Mary and Joseph got married that she was already pregnant. We, we know all that. You can't hide that from anybody. And it says, they, some translations say they took offense at him. But what that literally means is how it's said in the message, to be tripped over. They tripped over Jesus. They stumbled over him and his words. Another way to think about that is they found him too much for them. And they rejected him. And did you catch what happens next? Jesus responds, a prophet has a little honor in his hometown. But then right after that, Mark tells us, Jesus wasn't able to do much of anything there. Except he laid hands on a few sick people and he healed them. That's, that's about it. But he couldn't get over their stubbornness. So he left and made a circuit of the other villages teaching. So because this group began to reject Jesus and their faith in him was not that they had very little, but they had none, they pushed him away. And Mark tells us that Jesus was amazed. Just as they were amazed at his ability to do such wise and great things, he was amazed at their unbelief. Again, not that they didn't have any faith, but they had none. They had an absence of faith. And Mark tells us that Jesus was, he wasn't able to do much of anything there except heal just a few. How sad is that? But this man who is 100% God and 100% man, who has the power to raise the dead and heal the sick, and all he has to do is proclaim it with his lips, and they will be healed. But in this instance, in his hometown, 
he was not able to do what needed to be done. So I would suggest to us there's definitely a direct relationship with the ability of Jesus healing in our faith. And the unbelief that Jesus' own people had put a dampening effect on what he was able to do there. And if you will remember, this moment marked the end of his work there. He moved on. So before we even get to verses 7 through 13, what I find amazing in these first few verses, there's some bad news with this rejection. The bad news is Jesus just accepts their rejection. And he goes on. There's good news in this rejection. The good news is that Jesus is neither discouraged nor stops his work. He continues what he's been called to do in other places for whoever has the ears to hear. And so in this, these first six verses, it, it, it hits me hard in my heart and it makes me call into question myself because I hear a warning and a challenge in these words of Jesus after being rejected by his own people. The warning is this, you can have, Jason, you can have, you can profess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, but you can still misunderstand him and refuse to believe in him and his mission. That's a warning. The challenge is this, if, if, if those people in that hometown synagogue of Nazareth, if they would have believed Jesus, Jesus could have done a great deal more. So maybe you're thinking, what does that mean for us, Jason? Let, let's get it up to the 21st century. What does that mean for us in this context? I would suggest to us what that means for us, the church, from the pulpit all the way back. We, the church, in a way, set the spiritual climate. In other words, we, the church, should have a sense of expectation that something's going to happen? Do you come into this place on Sunday morning expecting something to happen? Do you come in here expecting God to move, or do you come in here saying, all right, I'm going to check off going to church? We, the church, should have a sense of expectancy that something amazing is going to happen through the work of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Because our expectancy level could have a great deal to do with how much God's power can accomplish in a specific community. And let's remember too, one's unbelief, just like for the people in Nazareth that day, one's unbelief does not mean that God is powerless. But unbelief can hinder the work that God desires to do. And what saddens me about this story is that when Jesus is rejected, He ends his work there. Does that not bother you? For the king of the universe to say, I'm done. And again, to me, the scary part, and thinking about my own life, is that God's going to do what God wants to do, with or without us. But he invites us to participate and believe with him and in him. So God's going to do what he wants to do. And we see that with Jesus. So if you don't want to have any part of me, that's cool. I'm going on to other villages who will and who will hear me. And I wonder if that's why this is. See, here's the deal with sermons. You just get to hear me think out loud just saying because I just think about these first six verses I wonder if that's why there's something to do with decline of the church in America and why it's growing exponentially in places like Asia and Africa just throwing it out there for us to think about so Jesus and his disciples have been at his hometown synagogue Jesus' disciples had seen just what went down. How Jesus' own family and his friends rejected him. I don't know what was going through their mind. I have no idea. The Gospels don't tell us. 
But look at what happens next. Verses 7 through 13. Jesus called the twelve to him, and he sent them out in pairs. He gave them authority and power to deal with the evil opposition. He sent them off with these instructions. Don't think you need a lot of extra equipment for this. I love this. You are the equipment. No special appeals for funds. Keep it simple. No luxury ends. Get a modest place to be content there until you leave. If you're not welcomed, not listened to, quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. Then they were on the road. They preached with joyful urgency that life can be radically different. Right and left, they sent the demons packing. They brought wellness to the sick, anointing their bodies and healing their spirits. So before Jesus told his disciples what they were to expect, he let them see it firsthand. They would be rejected. And so in sending them out, he sent out the twelve two by two. And he gave them authority of what to do, to go and to heal, to cast out demons. And he told them what to take with them, but he told them something of extreme importance. Something that oftentimes, if we're not careful, we will forget. You are the equipment. We, church, are the equipment that Jesus needs to go out and make a difference. Yeah, budgets are great. Yeah, having money's great. Yeah, having all the right things are great. Having the latest, greatest in audiovisual technology is great. Having everything that the world has to offer that is the best we can present is great. But at the end of the day, Jesus says, you are the equipment because you are the ones that I've charged to go and make disciples. You are the ones who have what it takes to go into other people's lives, to run to their messes, to begin a relationship, to build a relationship. And it's not because of what this other person can give you back, but it's because of how much I have loved you and how I have called you to love other people. So you are the equipment. You go. You have the power. And don't forget this, because Jesus told his disciples, you have power to do some amazing things. You have power to cast out demons. You have power to heal the sick. So let us not forget, church, who empowers us. It is the Holy Spirit. It is God himself dwelling within us, calling us to go to be the equipment. And he says, when you go, disciples, here's what to expect. If you're not welcomed, if you're not listened to, quietly withdraw. Other translations say, shake the dust off your feet. But I like that. I like the way the message says it. Puts it into our terminology. Quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. And I find it interesting that what Jesus told his disciples to do was exactly what he did when he was rejected by people. He quietly withdrew. He, in essence, shrugged his shoulders. And he went to other folks who were ready and willing to hear of the message of gospel and good news and repentance and hope. So Mark closes this story and saying they were sent out two by two. They went out with a message proclaiming that everybody should repent. And then he says they were casting out demons. They were anointing with oil those who were sick. And he cured them. There's something about Mark's gospel that, that calls into question throughout the entire gospel. Who do you say Jesus is? When you read Mark's gospel, you'll read through and you'll, you, you can read it how rulers, religious authorities, crowds, disciples, and even family members have the chance to answer that question. Who do you say Jesus is? If we say he is my Lord, and I will follow him, life can be radically different. If we say, He is my Lord, I will follow Him, then automatically when we make that declaration, we begin to call in the other questions. Where is our ultimate allegiance going to be to? Well, I value Jesus more than anything else in this world. 
Because as we begin to answer that question of who do we say Jesus is, we begin to understand where our faith truly lies. Is it in Jesus? Or is it in something else? But when we follow Jesus, life can be radically different. And I've already alluded to it, but I will go back to it and be a little more specific about it. The church today, not just the church local, but I think the church universal, especially the church in America, if we're not careful, we're going to find ourselves becoming more and more like the people of Jesus' hometown. We've become familiar with Jesus, and we've made Jesus to our own image. Did you not hear that when they were confronting him? Man, who are you? We know who you are. How do you have the right to say and do anything? See, for us, the church, a lot of times we've, we've come to make Jesus into the image that we would have him to be, which again goes back to this idea of cherry-picking Scripture. We pick out what we like and disregard what we don't like. And when we create Jesus into the image that we want, we only see what we think Jesus is like, not really who he is. And we'll be like those people in Jesus' hometown that we will trip over him. Because we'll think to ourselves, that's just a little too much, Jesus. You push the envelope a little too far, Jesus. So just like the real Jesus called his first disciples, he also calls us and he says, if you follow me, life can be radically different. It won't be a same old, same old, everyday deal when you follow Jesus. Follow Jesus and your life will never be the same again. Your life will be radically different. And again, our job as the church, our job as the family of Jesus, hear me out, is not to judge others. Over the past two weeks, the church has had an opportunity to voice their opinion on a variety of things. And no matter where you come down on the argument, if we didn't come out of that discussion loving all people the way we love ourselves, we failed the argument. See, our job as the church, as the family of Jesus, is not to judge others. You may disagree with me, and that's okay. Our job is not even to necessarily call out people as sinners. Our job is not to change anyone. We're called to love everyone. There's a pastor in Canada, Kerry Newhoff. He says this about the church. He says, judgment is a terrible evangelism strategy. People don't line up to be judged. Instead, they flee. So again, as we think about this Jesus and this Jesus that we oftentimes create in our image, sometimes we don't like the Jesus of radical love unless it's about love for us. But love for everybody else, I don't know about that. Sometimes we want the Jesus who says, I will help you only if you can help yourself. But again, Jesus never said that. For some Christians in America, Jesus is a flag-waving American Republican. The whole point I'm making is that we tend at times, if we're not careful, to create Jesus into an image that we want. And even political leaders and figures and parties make Jesus their mascot. As we're coming up on a presidential election in the next few months, you hear a lot about religion. But are they really following Jesus or is Jesus just their mascot trying to get another vote? We can become tripped up on Jesus when we create him in our own image of such things that I've mentioned. We can become tripped up on Jesus when we think that Jesus is the image of the battering ram. We want to blast through and, and, and batter everybody and everything, and we'll, we'll, we'll fall behind the justification of, well, Jesus and the gospel is offensive. And to that I would not disagree, except for Jesus and the gospel was offensive to the religious, not to the ones who were the cast down, the oppressed, and the hurting. What we've looked at in the Gospel of Mark for these last few weeks points always to what discipleship is about. It's not easy, but Jesus calls us to it. And not only does he call us to it, he empowers us with one that is greater than the one that's in the world. 
And Jesus calls us to follow him. And he gives us the reality check that when you follow me, life can be radically different. Even people that you love and people that you thought loved you will turn their back on you. They will reject you. And Jesus says, will you still follow me? So some questions, some things to think about as we come to a close today. How do we create Jesus into our own image? Rather than accepting the fact that Jesus wants to daily create us into his image. What about Jesus is tripping us up? That's a question only you can answer. Because when you look at what Jesus taught his disciples and taught others about becoming a follower. Hear this out. Jesus always presented the image of what we can be rather than what we are. Did you hear me? Jesus always presented the image of what we can be rather than what we are. So church, what that means for us is I think Jesus is calling us to say, hey, what can we be? Not just what are we. What can we be? As a body of believers, as a place that comes in here on 145 Grace Drive, every Sunday morning, what can we be? But let's not forget where we started this morning. Sometimes to be who Jesus wants us to be will make us uncomfortable. And I would even go so far to say that if we are going to follow Jesus, you can go ahead and accept the fact that there will be times it will be uncomfortable. And if we find ourselves being too comfortable, we just may not be following Jesus. sure you want to do this? sure you want to follow this Jesus? He never promised us comfort. Never. He never promised us that everybody would agree with us. But he promised us that he would always be with us. He would never leave us, never forsake us. He gave us the simple message and mission. Y'all go love one another. Go make more of you. Followers of me. By how you love one another. And it's not easy. It's uncomfortable. The greatest illustration of love ever that of Jesus with outstretched arms dying on a cross being beaten having been spat upon he still loved us enough to say father forgive them they don't deserve it Remember that passage we heard from Ezekiel earlier? They are rebellious people. From the pulpit all the way back. But Jesus says, I love them. In terms of following who God wants us to be, it will not always be comfortable. Just as I'm sure that cross was significantly uncomfortable. And that night as Jesus sat with his disciples, as he looked those men in the eye that he had spent some three, three and a half years of doing life with, looking at one and knowing, you're going to betray me, even called him out. Even called out another one and said, brother, you're going to deny me. You'll, You'll say you don't even know me. And the rest around that table would run off 
into the night because they were beginning to see how following Jesus, their life could be radically different. And it could get just a little uncomfortable. And some of them that night tripped over Jesus. But his love and his grace brought them back. So this morning, what I want you to hear before we remember the story of the breaking of bread and giving of the wine is that when you come to this table, when you have the invitation in the moment, I want you to come expecting, expecting for Jesus to meet you here. Expecting to find grace that you can't find anywhere else to experience love, nothing this world can give. And listening to the words from the Gospel of Mark and listening to me expound on about those words, if you feel like in your life you've been tripping over Jesus, just like his disciples did, he welcomes you back with love and grace. And this altar is open. And you can be prayed for. But we remember that night in which Jesus sat with his disciples. That he took bread and he lifted it up to God. He gave thanks to God. He broke the bread. He gave it to them, each and every one of them. And said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. When the meal was over, he took the cup. He lifted it up to God. He gave thanks to God. Then he gave it to his disciples. He said, take and drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this often, and as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Precious Lord, in remembrance of your mighty acts of salvation, we come into this place today. God, we admit that we are sinners. We admit that we need your grace. God, we know that even on our best days, we still fail you. But God, we believe that your love never fails. And we believe that you will never stop loving us. We believe that your grace covers all sin. And so, Lord God, we come to your table today. May we hear your invitation for all to come. No matter age, race, denomination, affiliation, no matter where we were last night and what we were doing last night, you invite us here to your table. And by the work of your Holy Spirit, make this bread and this wine be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we, your church, may be the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood sent out living a life radically different and following after you. Amen. My servers are coming. This time I do invite you to hear again the invitation is that Jesus invites you here. He invites you to come and to experience the grace that in some mysterious way we can experience here at this table. If you will come with open hands, bread will be placed into your hands. Then take the bread and place it into the cup, then into your mouth. You may circle back to your seat or you may come to the altar for prayer. But I challenge you today to know that you know that Jesus is with you. To know that you know that he has forgiven you. And that he has called you to a life radically different than that of what the world teaches us to have.
everyone could please stand on this last chorus. can't beat a love like that. It says, come just as you are to my table. And for Jesus, he always has an image in mind of who and what we can be, not who and what we are. And so he calls us to follow him, to find out just who we can be. So as we go today, let us have the ears to hear the good news God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that life can be radically different. And so let us heed the words of Jesus, going out from this place, bound together in love, to be the equipment needed for the hope of the world, sharing Jesus. Amen. And let's all join hands together as we sing Bind Us Together.